Hi, everybody, and welcome to Eye Openers. Thank you so much for joining me, Steve. And thank you, everybody else who's watching this either live or afterwards. Just thank you for being here. It's so fun to have you guys participate, asking questions and commenting afterwards. So if you're stopping by, let us know you're here. We'd love to make you part of the conversation. So to kick off, um, cheers and happy Monday. Uh, I call this show Eye Openers because not only are we trying to come through and create some business insights, we're also drinking some good stuff to get our eyes open. Now, sometimes I have this show super early in the morning, but we're going to have a little like afternoon jolt, if you will. Um, so what's in your cup, Steve? This is uh, coffee with oat milk, actually. <laughs> <laughs> are and, you like uh, a the guy like you're super particular about it up there or not so much i mean i wouldn't say i'm super particular about like you know the the where the beans are grown or if they're you know grown with with unicorns but um i i i do i grind them in a burr grinder with like fresh when i'm you know gonna about to yeah. make it Ooh. and then i use one of those pour over things actually i have it right here it's just it's a little out of reach but it's uh it's one of those like Chemex pour over things. Mm -hmm. Do you notice so. the difference with the Chemex like versus the like auto drips? I think so. I mean, some of the auto drips are pretty good these days um, where they they're able to cover all get, get the water everywhere. But it's it's hard to do hard to do it as well as a Chemex can. Yeah. Yeah. And that, so I think the, I, get you, I think you get a little more like uh, soaking of the beans this way. Right. Right. Well, hope it tastes good. Um, I am over here in Santa Barbara and we have a local shop called Handlebar. I've been uh, trying to try out all the different ones, but I keep coming back. I don't know if it's like the vibe or the location is just easy, but um, and I'm also representing um, my hometown of Portland, Oregon. My mom gave me this. <laughs> I don't know why. I was like, I need a Santa Barbara mug, not Portland, but it does remind me of home. So it's nice and cozy. Um, so, well, let's get around to giving you like a proper introduction and not just the type of coffee that you drink. Um, Steve is here with us. He is the founder and CEO of Badger Maps, which happens to be the number one app in the app store for outside and field salespeople to upgrade existing CRMs with mapping, routing, and scheduling. He also hosts the Outside Sales Talk, which is why you're going to be like a pro guest here. You're so used to it. And it's specifically to talk about outside salespeople, um, specifically for, sorry, outside salespeople. And you're also president of the Sales Hall of Fame. So that's exciting because I want to really pair with like what got you here, like what got you to CEO of Badger Maps, which I know has an extensive sales history. Um, and also like what are, how are those challenges that you face then different than the ones you face today, leading a multicultural team, a growing organization, um, super exciting stuff, but different challenges. So let's launch right off into something which I call like a bit of a stump of a question, but it gets you thinking, it gets you like a taste of what we're about here at Eye Openers. If we were to speak three years from now or when we speak three years from now, 2024, what are you going to have accomplished that you'd be so excited to tell me about? Like, oh, Brittany, it's so great to hear from you. I'm so glad we're doing another podcast interview. I can't wait to tell you about what we've done. All right. Well, three years from now, um, so the company's been growing pretty fast lately. And so, you know, if I can just maintain this growth rate, that, that would be pretty exciting in and of itself. Uh, it gets harder and harder to grow a business at the same growth rate, the larger it gets. And so, we're like, a, I guess I'd call us a medium sized company now. We're like, uh, we have 70 employees, um, but we've been growing until COVID. We've been, we've been pretty flat through COVID. The last six months have been better again, but uh, COVID was a regular, relatively flat time because we make software for field salespeople, a lot of whom were uh, went out of business or were furloughed in, uh, in COVID. So now people are right. coming back and things are getting, getting, uh, getting back to normal again with, uh, with those folks. And so, um, we're, we're, we've been seeing them come back, but, uh, so three years from now, hopefully the, the growth, the growth rate will have kept going at its, its historical rate, which is, you know, hovers depending on the year we've done you know, between 30 and 50% growth rate. So 
in three years, I'll still be plowing all the extra money we, we earn back into the business, like hiring more people, basically. Um, as a right. software company, you know, we basically have one thing we spend money on, and that's people, whether they're engineers or marketing or sales or uh, mm -hmm. product management, thing, all those different types of roles. So in, in three years, I would I would guess it will be around between 120 and 150 people. Um, I'll, I'll uh, more exciting news would be that I, I should have opened up our Australia offices and our Canadian offices to add to um, right now we have offices, offices in Spain and San Francisco and, uh, and uh, U Salt Lake City, Utah. And then uh, we also have a presence in the Philippines, but that's not an office that's working from home. Okay. So that's super exciting to think about your business doubling in size, multiple offices and um, having Badger Maps out into um, different countries as well. Um, now, what is the impact that that creates, right? Those are like the things that you hope to happen. What's the impact that that creates and what becomes possible for people who use the software, like with that expansion, with that growth, with those accomplishments? Well, uh, I mean, so that, as we grow, we, a lot of the people that we hire are engineers who just make the product better. And, um, you know, there, there, we've done a lot of things for field salespeople up till now. And the, the goal is the, the strat, the strategy going forward is to stay focused on that group of people, field salespeople. And there are, there are several roles that don't call themselves field salespeople, but really what they, they, they behave like a real estate agent behaves an awful lot like a field salesperson, even though they would call themselves a real estate agent, not a, not a field mm -hmm. salesperson. Right. Um, so, We'll, we'll continue to develop software and products for those groups of people and, and, and build new things for them. Um, we're, we're coming out right now with our, our second big product that, you know, isn't a feature of our first product, but really has nothing to do with it. And is like, you know, sold separately, that sort of thing. Um, and that's, that'll be re released here in November. That's a, uh, it's like a training product for field salespeople. It's like a, uh, it's kind of like Netflix, but it's not cool videos you're watching that are entertaining. It's, it's videos to teach you how to do, be a better salesperson. Um, and so, uh, Netflix for, for sales training basically is how I describe it in five word five words or so, but so that that'll, that'll release here. So hopefully that'll catch on and we'll, we'll get people to use that and they'll get value out of it. And my, I guess over the next three years, I just, I, I plan on kind of continually continuing to create value and reach out to more people that are, that are in sales and specifically field sales is our area of focus, um, especially, particularly on the first product, but that's kind of the next three years. Okay. So what are some of those skills that you believe got you to where you are today, but like maybe in a less linear way. So tell mm -hmm. us a bit about, you know, what were you doing before Badger and how are you using some of those skills now, maybe in an unexpected way? Sure. Uh, well, my my background was I, I studied business in school. I, I got a, an MBA um, and uh, so that's kind of my academic background. Then I worked at IBM, so kind of broad technology. You know, they they're, they're, they got their fingers into everything, hardware, software, consulting, everything. And so I got kind of general, uh, a general feel for the tech space there. Then I went to a software company called Autonomy, which uh, makes a specific piece of software. And then um, when I was there, we, we, were, we had one of the early cloud computing products. And... Uh, that we were selling with that model. And so then I got a job at Google, who was another leader in that space, kind of as the as software switched to being sold on a disk to being sold um, as a service. Mm -hmm. And so then I was at Google for about four years. And um, I guess this, the, I, I, I had a unique experience there, I think, because I was specifically working on their enterprise software products at the time. So things like G, you know, they sell Gmail to companies, companies mm -hmm. have their own version of Gmail, Google Docs, um, Google Maps. They had some security software, and I was especially focused on Google Maps uh, towards, especially towards the end of my time there. And mm -hmm. uh, I think I was really—it was a fortunate time to be there because cloud computing was pretty early. I mean, this is—you know—I started Badger ten years ago, so this is four years before that. Um, so almost fifteen years ago now. Um, and uh, so I, I got to see that—that that was an, an early business now for them. Now it's a pretty big business, all the stuff they're doing there. But you know, with on their—they call it Google Cloud now. 
Um, but then, I mean, when I joined, it was only like a, I think a 200 person organization. And uh, so I kind of got to see how a really big, smart, effective company grew a business and, uh, and, and got to be a part of that and kind of learn how, how some of the best folks around approach that. And um, whether from, you know, a sales side or a marketing side or um, a leadership side, the different thing I, I got, I got to watch a lot of smart people do what they do. And then when I started Badger, you know, I, I tried to replicate a lot of those cultural items, a lot of the, th a lot of their processes, a lot of the way that, ways they did things. Um, I tried to do in a similar way. So I think that that was a big part of um, how I learned and how I developed uh and, you know, how did I get to be CEO? Well, I, I, I started the company, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's how you become founder. You know, you have to do something right to get to stick around as CEO. True, true. Well, I, you know, I, I do think that um, sales is a really good training ground. A sales background is a really good training for, for CEOs. Um, whether you're selling investors ideas, whether you're selling employees, the vision, whether, and that's a big part of what you do as a CEO is you kind of show, Hey, here's the ship. Here's the direction we're sailing. Here's how we're going to, here's how we're going to do it. Here's, you know, point it. You, a lot of it is just that, that direction and that structure. And then you, you let the experts who own the different parts of the business do what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think, uh, that, that's I, I think that's a big part of it is, it, it, but I do think sales in general kind of breeds it. It, it breeds leadership in in ways that other other roles maybe don't. What if, what about for those of us watching that didn't have a sales background, and maybe now they find themselves running a business? And most of my um, clients are business owners, and so if they don't have that, what's one or two things that you could share from that kind of education on the ground that you got? That could be most helpful. Um, most helpful sales tips and tricks. Um, <laughs> well, I have a whole podcast on this outside sales talk. Oh, <laughs> but, I set that up well. But beyond yeah. the tips, like what's yeah. a what's a perspective? Like what's a paradigm that you're using? I think the most important lens here is is you're you're always seeking to look at things through your customer's perspective, make their process with you easier, make their you know, using your product easier for them, make onboarding with your product easier for them. Lit, talk, talk to at, at any stage in the in the company's life cycle. Mm -hmm. Always talk to as many customers as you can to kind of learn what, either get feedback from them, learn what they want, learn what they wish you did, what they like, what they like that you do, because um, it's not always what you'd guess, right? Like uh, the yeah. things they say that are really important to them, and and you want to do more of those things, and. That's, that's why they stick around and keep paying you and why they tell their friends they like it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think if, if, if there was one key to sales, it's listen to your customers. And uh, in terms of like being an actual leader, I guess it's a little different if you're an actual salesperson trying to close a deal. But if you're, if you're running a business, the, sales, the key sales skills are listen to the customers and, and, and figure out what they need listen what they need about what what's valuable to them and what they could use more of um that's really the key the key lens that i, that I would look at that, that you could learn from uh, the key the key blocking and attacking skill from a salesperson that you can learn as a ceo awesome awesome yeah what another thing that i think about in that feedback loop is people forget to ask um the the pitches that didn't go well or the potential customers that they didn't land they forget to ask them for feedback too. And that mm -hmm. can be a really great learning opportunity. So even as in this uh, CEO seat, you know, if something isn't going well, get lots of beta, get lots of feedback in those situations too, not just from deals. That it, it's a huge piece of advice. And I would actually, make, I, I would take that. Um, I, I would try to make that a process in your business where when a deal is lost that you, you know, was, a salesperson forecasted or said said was going to happen and then it didn't happen. Um, mm -hmm. Have a process that you run to find out why. Like, and because and the salesperson can't call them up and ask them why. It has to be someone else that's like, "Hey, I'm on the product team, trying to gather feedback about what about our product or our or our process you didn't like or could have gone better." Um, but you do need to have someone else besides the salesperson gather that data because you know um, they they were just too close to it and. Uh, yeah. 
and, and, and the person's going to be on their heels if you approach them with a salesperson. But if you have someone from marketing call or from the product team, you can really gather some great information. Awesome. So tell us about your number one initiative today, things that you're thinking about that, um, that you wake up with fresh ideas about. What is the number one thing you're focused on? Um, right now, what I'm really focused on is the, is the mid funnel. Like, I mean, strategically for the company, like we, people who are in field sales are generally aware that we exist. They're generally aware of what we're doing. So right now, what, and, and once they engage with our sales team and like, you know, do a trial with their team, for example, they, they, they generally do end up purchasing, but a lot more people know about us than actually have gone, gone as far as to do a trial of the, of the product and, and actually create a, create a project in their organization to, to get something done. So, um, my big focus right now strategically is the, is what I would call the mid funnel. So people that know about us, but aren't, you know, haven't, haven't engaged the sales team. So what, helping them figure out what they need to recognize that this is a really valuable thing and that they actually should make a project out of it. So helping them understand the ROI, helping them understand the competitive landscape, helping them understand the core, the value that their business will get in, in, in terms of dollars uh, by, by doing a project with us. Those are probably my biggest, that, that's my biggest strategic kind of framework that I'm approaching right now. Mm -hmm. So understanding what that group needs and what where the greatest ROI that they'd recognize is. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And um, what's your process like around that? You know, what um, who are you engaging with internally, externally to solve that well, problem? Primarily, that's uh, the that's marketing that that owns that. So it's product marketing and content marketing and. Um, you know, it's, it touches the web team and, and all these different groups of people that are on, but it's, it's primarily marketing's, uh, mar marketing's area to, to handle. Um, and you know, all we're, we are already doing all the things that we should be doing, but you know, how can we do them better? How can we, how can we help someone who has learned that us and this, this other company do this? How do we figure out who's better? How do we, um, and I think historically we've just kind of been like, well, try them out or we think ours is better just try it but it's it's almost i think people are busy and you know it's 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 the the challenge is getting them to actually get over the hump to try it out and make it a project right like it's like people can only have so many projects and you know the person who often deals with our stuff is like a sales operations person or you know sales leadership of some kind and those people are busy and they've got, you know, they're, they're trying to keep the CRM standing up and communicating with all the other stuff and doing all the things that it should do. And that, that often takes a lot of their mind share and uh, getting them to add this on as a, as a tool that connects with their CRM is like, it, it's, it often, I think becomes like, okay, that's, we should definitely do this. I see why it would help the, the field sales team, but how do we, you know, it's number 10 on the list of things to do because before we do that, we've got to, you know, make the CRM do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's tricky. That's tricky. Are you guys capturing and understanding what your customer's biggest initiative is in that moment, right? Because it's easier to jump onto a moving train. Yeah, we, we, I think, you know, in general, once they're engaged, the once someone's engaged with the sales team, the salespeople do try to try to understand what's important to them so they can help them map what we do to what their initiatives are. Mm -hmm. You know, in general, the thing we help people do is we, we make your sales team more efficient, right? More, right. They, they get more done in the same amount of time. It's a, you know, at its core, right. it's a routing and mapping software. It helps focus them on what they should be doing given their constraints. Like, Oh, well, I'm going to the suburb anyway. Who else should I be hitting next Thursday? Mm -hmm. Um, that that that's one of the core things that we do and so you know I, I think people in general selling more is almost always on on people's list of of uh of important things to do this year right it's like we'd like to increase sales and decrease costs that's those are the big initiatives right now business <laughs> but so it but the challenge is, I think, you know, there's, there's 5,000 types of, uh, 5,000 ways you can use software and technology and processes to make your sales team a little better. 
what our challenge is, is, is helping people understand why this is, this is an easy win that they can implement quickly and that they can, um, that they'll, they'll see real results out of, you know, two weeks later. And, and so it's, it's, it, helping them see that, that it's important enough to prioritize, I think, is our biggest challenge as a marketing right. team right now. Right, right, right. And and that that's tricky, right? Because, oh my gosh, I mean, I know for me, it becomes so much easier to do my job when people open up and share a lot of their da their data sets and whatnot. Like if I can see like, oh, how many, you know, leads you have in this pipeline in this stage and then this stage, I can see kind of where the a problem might be. But in this in this section of the sales it's really hard to get people that bought in they're going to share like a lot of confidential information lots of times they can't right and so you're trying to kind of have to do a little bit of guesswork to figure out you know where they're at exactly where that pain point is at exactly um to create the efficiency for it um but that's just my impression where would you say that you feel you're most vulnerable in your business Right. So part of this podcast is about sharing where um, we don't feel most confident, where we are showing up at, you know, with 100 percent mastery, because so many people out there don't feel like they have a place to talk about this. I mean, this is what I hear all day long in my business. And so where would you where do you feel like, you know, this is something I'm working on or we're leaning into? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I guess. Uh several things one we we have more to do with our engineering team than we have engineers right so we have there's a bunch of initiatives that we just haven't gotten to start we've been working on a pretty major initiative for um a couple of years now on the engineering team and that's really sucked up a lot of our bandwidth so we have been pushing out a whole bunch of new features we've been more focused on getting this one thing that we felt was really strategic and really important out, you know, out the door. It's basically, uh, it, it's a, it's a version three of our software. So right now everyone's on version two and, and pushing out version three, which has a bunch of changes in the way it's structured. And it's a lot of, you know, back end techno mumbo jumbo to explain, to explain what we're doing, but it's, uh, it's really important for the way we can connect to CRMs and, uh, the speed at which we can do it. The, uh, the way we can connect to multiple parts of the CRM so we can you know, show your customers and your opportunities and your check-ins all on a map at the same time, stuff like that. It, it, and automation, there's a whole bunch of things that are all wrapped up into this one project um, that should be done um, Q1 of this coming year, uh, 2022. So that, you know, we're, we're, we're very focused on that. And from, from an engineering side, I think that's our, that's definitely a weak spot is that we haven't been coming out with like new stuff. We kind of solve the problems that we initially set out to solve and then like stopped work on, on that and started create and started like rebuilding it from the ground up to make it all better basically. <laughs> and so, so that's a big, that's a big challenge for us on a big weak spot for us right now. And uh, 2022 should be an exciting year because when that because when that rolls, you know, you you roll it out to a, a few people, and then you know the you, the the business that like needed there are a bunch of people that need some things in there before they can buy. So you roll it out to them first, and then you start cutting existing customers over, and then you cut like all the the rest of the customers over. So it's that that'll that'll keep us busy for uh, Q2 Q3 of uh, 2022. Wow. Yeah, that sounds like a huge undertaking. But back to what you you know talked about earlier, it sounds like it's going to solve a lot of the problems that you're facing with CRM integration and that being an obstacle for mm -hmm. buy-in. Yeah, yeah. And, and and we we integrate with CRMs right now, but it it's harder to set up than it should be and it's harder to get going than it should be. It takes, you know, two weeks. We'd like it to take days or or even um, for the major CRMs, just be something that you someone can do on their own that are our um, our deployment team doesn't have to get involved in. So a lot of this is helping people do things on their own. Like right now, if people want to make certain changes, they have to like send us an email and we make the change. We want to expose all that type of, all of that to the end user and let them do it themselves. Right, right, right. That's amazing. Good. That'll make a, hopefully a big change for you guys, a big difference in uh, your end user experience. And I want to say thank you for being willing to share that. I know that's um, a lot of, shows don't ask a question like that, but it is really important, I think, to highlight that there are things that we're all working on to make our business stronger um, and that people aren't alone in facing that and feeling like, 
ah, I'm supposed to know all these answers and I don't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned that uh, you have 70 employees. I know that they're in different locations and your plan is to even double in size. You know, what do you anticipate or what are you already dealing with and what maybe do you anticipate dealing with as you grow um, on the people side and the internal side of things and um, really just keeping Badger a great place to work? Yeah, well, I mean, and we think about that a lot. Uh, you know, the HR team is is uh, I'm, I'm, we're we're always chatting about what the initiatives that we can have to to be, to make this a better place to work, and for you know, what initiatives you have there. One one that jumps to mind, we have an you know, as we grow, we so we currently have an initiative that um, people who have had a kid can come back half time, half pay, full benefits, which is very unique in America. It's not you know, especially unique if you live in Switzerland, but <laughs> it's kind of table stakes there. But here, that's a super unique thing. And I think that's that's a big part of as we scale and as we grow um, over the next three or four years, it's a big, it's a big selling point. And, um, and you know, it's, it, we, it, it's an ongoing challenge too, because as, you know, it, as some of our employees basically leave half the time, we have to replace them with other people. So it's like, it, because it's, <laughs> um, but I think that that's uh, that, that's a cool initiative that we have and, and super unique. And I think it, it it's attractive to a, a, a broad swath of people who who really would value that. And so mm -hmm. I, that, that's a key piece of in terms of our hiring strategy. That's something that we offer that really no one else that I know of does. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So what uh, why is that valuable to you? Like, why is it important to you? Well, so I, I believe that in general, people, businesses don't value long-term employment enough and employees don't value what they get from working at the same place as much as they should. Um, that's a big change from when I started my career till now is, um, you know, there were, when I started at IBM, most people you were interacting with were IBM lifers, right? They'd been there for 15, 20 years. They will be, they would be retiring in 10 more years, right? Like they had no plans on leaving, you know, they know, how to get things done in the company. They know, you know, they know the history, they know who's who they, there's all this knowledge that gets built up over time. And, uh, and it's because IBM really made themselves a place where people could have a long ongoing career. I mean, um, they, they, well, I, I guess they didn't have it when I started, but soon people that joined a few years before me still had like pensions and stuff, right? Like, um, they had they just they had geared themselves toward being a a long term hirer and, and you know they, they they wanted people to only work for them and and not see a need to go anywhere else and you know they they paid market wages and uh, you know they weren't above average or below average but you know they treated people well and, and had a bunch of programs to keep people around and uh, and and that's really I, I, that was one of my biggest lessons that I took from IBM was the value that how on how much everyone under underrates that value and how important that actually is. Um, and, uh, and so I've tried to build Badger in a way that, that keeps people around and, and keeps them growing, keeps them interested. And uh, we have a very low attrition rate. People stay, you know, well, we're, we're not that old, we're not that old long. We haven't been around for that long. We're only 10 years old, but people, <laughs> we, we have, we have, we, we have really low attrition rates, but um, uh, the, the uh, and I and I'm that I think this is a key initiative to keep people around and and you know treating people fairly, treating people well, figuring out you know how we can be a great employer and and then actually executing on that. Those are really big goals of ours over the next uh, few years, and and it's so much easier if you're going to grow from seventy people to one hundred and fifty if you don't lose fifty of the seventy in the process, right? So yeah. that's really that. You know, they, they're and and you can onboard people so much easier if there's a bunch of people around to train them. Um, but it's tricky because the uh, the way a lot of people approach their careers now, um, I don't want to point any fingers in any particular generations, but you know, people who are <laughs> people who are 30 now, let's just say, um, are they they often bounce from job to job and they don't go as deep in any one role. And I think they they often miss out on how how much you can learn, um, uh, you know, if, if you have been at one in one place at one time for a long period of time, right? You the, just the the ability to 
understand where all the bodies are buried, how everything works, who does what you, you can learn more in that organization and get a seat at the decision-making table after you know, you're, you just by nature, by being around you, you know, more and more, and you start, be, you get a, you get more and more responsibility and more and more important roles uh, over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's you pointed out a few things there that I wanted to comment on. I mean, with the IBM example, there's this clear investment in the individual that happens and everybody thinks like, oh, I just have to pay above market. But that's not true. There's so many different ways you can invest in a team member that really speaks to them. And most importantly, I encourage people just to ask because it's going to be different for different people. Like you gave the, the parent example, like maybe that person would value more flexibility or a four day work week or whatever. Um, and, and so often we don't ask, we just assume, or we assume what's right for us is right for everybody, or that's what motivates everybody. And it's really not the case, especially when you have multiple generations um, in your organization. Um, but also there, I was reading a book, totally not about business, and it was giving this um, example about how traumatic moving can be. And having recently just moved across the country, I was like, this is so validating. Thank you for that. I knew I was feeling burnt out. I couldn't figure out why. Um, but it's because our brain stays in this high alert place and everything is brand new. The coffee shop is brand new, the street, the grocery store, the post office, like everything. And so our brain is kind of like in this high alert cortisol state and it's getting burnt out, can't operate, can't sustain that way for a long time. When you move from organization to organization, the same thing is going to be happening because there isn't that time invested. There isn't that trust and rapport built with people in all these different areas of the organization. And when you have to constantly show up and prove yourself and develop those relationships and build that trust, it's not only exhausting for you, but it's much more of a, um, you, you're driven to do things differently than you would if you were thinking more long-term in an organization that you were also invested and committed to, right? It's like the argument of public versus private for your, for your company, right? Like, do you go public, but you have to stay concerned about these quarterly earnings and numbers because that changes your decision-making if you didn't have that pressure on you. So it's mm -hmm. the same thing with individuals. We show up differently when we're like, oh, just I need to just impress this person this month or and not think about who do I need to be like over a 20-year um, tenure here. Absolutely, yeah. No, I, I think that there's, there's a huge opportunity for um, people who are in the first 10 years of the – maybe 15 of their 15 years of their career the, a lot of your peers don't view don't 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 actually see the value of being tenured at a place where and so it's a, a great way to move up is to is to just stick around and keep learning you know because everyone else is moving around five years in you're you're one of you're in the old school of the organization basically <laughs> yeah you're a veteran um so what do you what do you think about the great resignation then and how is Badger looking at that, or what are you personally? Well, I think uh, you know there's there's a lot of reasons that that people are moving around right now. You know, I think there's there's been kind of an upset to the to the balance of things. You know, for for a lot of reasons, and I think a lot of people would point to the you know the all, all the subsidies we gave to people to to stay at home and sit on the couch, and I. I wouldn't actually say that that's probably one of the bigger things that's affecting things here, especially the data that's come out more recently about, um, you know, the states that that took that away earlier actually didn't see a big that, that didn't solve their problem, and and so I wouldn't say it didn't do anything, but probably was a, not nearly as big as some other contributing factors uh, to the labor market. Um, key things that I, that, that I would say are probably more important than that we, you know, had generous benefit, generous benefits to not work that, that, that surely pulled some people out of the, out of the system. But uh, things that I think are probably more important were uh, people just kind of throwing in the towel and retiring earlier than they thought they were going to just because, you know, they were older, more vulnerable to coronavirus, didn't, didn't want to make it, the, the transition was harder to, to working from home for some people than others. And, and some of those people were closer to retirement age. Um, so there, there's that, that, cert, that demographic, I think we lost a lot, a lot of seniority in the, in, in, in the labor force, just, you know, kind of, kind of said, well, you know, I actually think I, I, I've got, a, I've got enough, enough to retire. This is cool. I was in work. I would have given you four more years, but uh, not like this. I'm out. Um, 
and, and a lot of people, you know, they work because they of the people they work with and the transition to home kind of made it less fun. And uh, so there's that group. I think one of the biggest contributors was childcare men and women who, uh, you know, need to care for their kids, you know, that weren't in school anymore, had to basically drop out of the labor force. I think that that, uh, that was a, a huge, had a huge impact that we haven't wrapped. We, we don't have the data around it, but I bet that was probably one of the biggest contributors is just people, people are like, well, I mean, someone's got to take care of my kids and my spouse is, makes more money or, you know, has the better job or has the, the job that's harder to replace or, or whatever the thinking was. So, but one of us has to stay home and like, homeschool them or deal with them now. And, uh, child care is tougher, you know, after school care is tougher, uh, daycare is tougher. All, all these things have been impacted. So I think, uh, I think that's a big thing that happened in the labor market. Um, was there anything else that jumps out at me? I think I had one, one more thing in mind. I can't think of what it is now, but th those are, those are some of the big ones I think that really and and also i think people just reshuffling reshuffling their lives in a lot of ways right they, they move it moving to a different place cutting expenses down like i you know, i lived in san francisco um for the last 20 years a lot of people I, I just i moved to la over over coronavirus a lot of people left la i i, I only have a couple friends that stuck it out or i'm sorry left left san francisco yeah what's that there's so many people from san francisco here in santa barbara Sure, sure, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Well, and and they moved all over the place to, for a lot of reasons, right? I mean, you know, I, I I can think of a lot of reasons to move to Santa Barbara, but they also moved to Phoenix and Texas and Kansas yeah. City and Chicago for lots of reasons, right? Tax reasons, and uh, you know, better, you know, just cheaper cost of living. Wanted to start a family, and this and the schools are better in other, in other places. Wanted to wanted uh, you know to buy a house, and they were. It's real hard to buy a house in the Bay Area, right? So for a lot of reasons, people left. And, and that's just San Francisco, right? Like there, I think there was a, sh th this caused a shuffling uh, in a lot of people. And a, a part of shuffling is often that different jobs are a better fit for you going forward. Also, I think a lot of people were at their jobs. They like the people they work with. And if they're not with the people they work with anymore, then maybe they should, maybe they look, maybe they should look into switching jobs. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, a lot of movement for a lot of reasons. And so a lot of, that opened up a lot of holes that then other people can who who would have otherwise stayed in their current job now can go after that hole at that other company or the same company, but it moves people around. So all these, just that, that reshuffling that, that I think has really affected the economy in a, in a big way. We haven't seen a ton of that. I mean, just because I, I think we, we do do a really good job of making people happy to work here. And when they compare it with their options, they, they don't love it. And, and we didn't have to, um, you know, make any huge, we, nothing huge changed with us. So you know, I, I think we haven't been affected that much by it, but that doesn't mean that we definitely won't be over the next, you know, year and we'll, we'll see what happens. But um, it's, it's definitely there. There's a lot going on out there right now. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I hear about your growth initiative. I hear about your three-year goals. And I hear about what's super valuable to you, which is um, investing in your people and having um, low attrition. Well, that's really a result of you really investing in your values and, and the people and the organization. Um, beyond the policy that you've created um, to honor those who've had a kid and, and keep the benefits up for them, what, what else are you considering or what kind of questions are you asking yourself? What kind of conversations are you guys having about how to keep that going as you guys grow? Because a lot of people face this challenge when they're at this like inflection point of growth where it was easy when it was a team of 10. Things were different when it was a team of 30, right? There's like a few of these mm -hmm. growth that um, things have to change. And yeah. And we've gone through, we've gone through several of those already and it does change. It changes a ton of stuff. Um, so I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. So I'm curious, you know, what, what kind of um, like policies or initiatives or really investments, like, are you looking at um, to continue to keep up that same, um, that same pace or really those same results of a low attrition in at, at Badger Maps as you guys grow? Um, so a, a big one, one big HR initiative we have right now is kind of better mapping out people's career trajectories. Um, figuring out, you know, 
where, what are the different directions that this particular role can go? Um, what do you want to do? Having com- having those conversations with people, um, that that's an, an important part. I think is is keep if you want to. One major reason people leave and go elsewhere is because they have other things that they want to do. Right? They they that are you know uh, they were a manager and now they want to be a director, or they were a director and now they want to be a VP. They want to switch into a, a, an adjacent thing. Um, so helping people be able to realize their goals here is is one key initiative. Um, I try to do most leadership and management hires pr- through promoting from within. I think you, you you need to bring in bring in some people from the outside to bring in fresh ideas and and uh, and new ideas. But I, another another way we that I think that we can retain people is by by not just always topping people, but bringing in bringing especially where it's appropriate, bringing in people from the outside. Um, uh, but, you know, and, and I'm not sure the exact number that you should do that. I mean, I've heard 50, 50, I've heard 70% of your employees should be, should be uh, from the outside. I, I think we're, I'm shooting for around 50, 50 going forward, but historically we've, we've, we've mostly promoted from within. Um, so I'm, and, and so going forwards, keeping it at 50, 50 would be, is, is kind of my, the, my soft goal, I would say. Um, but it really depends on the role. Some roles you, you, you want to bring in new, you know, fresh ideas and fresh blood. Other, other roles are, are really, it's more valuable to, to have someone who knows where all the bodies are buried and how everything works and knows all the people and that sort of thing. So yeah, right. this depends, right. but yeah. I, I'd say those, those are kind of the three initiatives that I have that, that mm-hmm. hopefully will allow us to, to maintain a, a, a great culture as we, as we grow. Cool. Um, I'll ask you one last thing. Um, what do you feel is a, a behavior or something that you guys implemented that got you to this growth point, like where you are today, but might hold you back going forward, this next phase of growth? Something you guys do, or you personally or the team that has been awesome, but you might have to, might hold you back. Um. I think that we've always uh, been very sales heavy. Like we, we rely on our, on our customer success and, and word of mouth to, to spread the, na- the, the word about what we're doing. You know, we're sales heavy in that, like we, we really try to engage people and, 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 you know, get them on board and, and work with them actively. I think we have to do a lot more product led growth where people can just on their own, show up and interact with the product and get value without ever having to speak with, with anyone from here. And so that's been a, 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 that's a big part of our, our new release is just helping people be able to get value without having, there's a lot of people that are hesitant to jump on the phone with someone. And so showing, allowing them to get more value without having to do that, making it a little easier for them um, is a change that we're trying to make that, that uh, the, I think would really be helpful for us going forward. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really can't say how much I appreciate your candidness in this. Um, it's so great for all of our learning and hopefully for your reflection. Um, I want to give people the opportunity to learn more about Badger and reach out to you. How could people find you? Yeah, um, LinkedIn's probably the best place to find me. Just search Steve Benson Badger Maps. I'll, I'll pop up. Um, there's a serial killer named Steve Benson, but he's... <laughs> He's he's already dead. I'm still alive, so it's that that's that's how you can keep us apart. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> what's that? Does that guy have a LinkedIn? That's yeah, you know. that's a great question. He he was an older guy and has been in jail for a long time before before he died. So I you know I I don't know if he actually you know went after joined the the whole social media revolution 15 years ago. We'll see. I mean. Differentiate yourself. You know, they, we have to see Benson. We want to make sure. Right. He he looks a lot older, and he is dead. But <laughs> but uh, he is the he's by far the more famous Steve Benson. But um, but yeah, that's the best way. What you're saying. What? Yeah. Don't confuse. Don't us. Google uh, Steve Benson. Yeah. Go, when you Google us, I definitely don't come up first. He's way more. He is way more famous than me. Uh, but. Uh, but yeah, so LinkedIn, just you know, search Steve Benson Badger Maps. Uh, if you're if you are in field sales, definitely worth checking out um, what we're doing over at uh, over at Badger Maps with for field salespeople. 
And if you're in, if you're just in sales in general, the, the Badger Sales University should be a pretty cool product. We're going to be yeah. launching that in, uh, in November if all goes well here. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Definitely always learning. So um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, if people are finding this on LinkedIn, you're already going to be tagged in it. So that'll be super easy to reach out to you. I'll make sure the information's on the other platforms. Thanks again for coming. And hopefully you guys got your eyes open to what is possible in sales and leading a team. Thanks again. Have a good one.